Um, hello to everyone who's not on a morning time zone. Uh, my name is Andrei Poenaro. I am a PhD student at the University of Bristol in the UK. Um, and I'm going to sh uh, present to you a short summary of our paper on the uh, effects of white vector operations on processor caches. Um, so at Bristol, we have worked with a variety of HPC architectures for, um, for a few years now, including Has it disappeared? I'm sorry. Yes, it's, no, that's okay. Come on. What's I don't know why, because like Zoom, Zoom told me it stopped sharing, but everything is still on my screen. Let me do it again. Let's try sharing again. Don't worry. Is that, what is a technical good issues. online event without a technical issue? Without having screen sharing issues. Are we back now? All good. Excellent. Okay. So um, at Bristol, we've looked at a variety of HPC architectures over the past years, um, including ARM-based CPUs like the Marvel Thunder X2 or the Fujitsu XTC4FX, more traditional x86-based CPUs from Intel and AMD, um, as well as GPUs. My work is generally focused around uh, future and modern future architectures for HPC. And when we study architectures, we generally take one of two approaches. Either we look at um, a cross-platform our uh, studies where we compare different architectures and we investigate how we can obtain the best performance across a wide range of them. Our work with performance portability is a good example of that. And the other kind of study is where we deep dive in a single architecture trying to understand uh, what, are its, um, what are its strengths, weaknesses and how to, make, uh, how to best take advantage of it. One of the architectures that is most interesting to us um, lately is the ARM SVE, because this is the architecture that is now in use on the latest generation of ARM-based CPUs, will be used in future uh, processors as well. The A64 FX in Fugaku, of course, have uh, SVE, and we are planning to add some of the same processors to our own ISMBAR2 system later this year. Um, so it is something that we will be working a lot with. We started working with SVE a lot, bef a lot, a long while before uh, hardware was available, and we thought that was very important because that allows you to get the rolling start when hardware does become available. And we have been using tools such as simulators and emulators from the very early uh, versions of, of SVE and the tools that supported it. And we've been working closely with people like ARM and the system vendors to iron out some of the um, early bugs and identify weaknesses that have, have then been fixed, which has led to having uh, performant mature tool chains from the very first versions. SVE is also interesting from a research point of view because it brings a, a, new, a new research problem with its uh, vector length agnostic design. So SVE uh, as, a, as an architecture supports different vector lengths and each implementation is able to choose its own. So we believe it's very important to understand the effects that this choice has on the applications that we run on those processors. Uh, there, are a f uh, uh, there are different applications, there are very different systems and the interactions between the choices you make designing the si these systems may not be uh, obvious from the beginning. Uh, this paper focuses on the interactions of the SVE with cache. So we're looking at the cache in, um, in the CPU. This is, of course, a very, in, uh, a very important part of chips. Pretty much all modern processors rely on cache to provide good uh, latencies and, um, and access speeds to main memory. But it is a very, uh, a very wide multidimensional problem. There are many design choices that you make when you design the cache system for, uh, for a processor. Um, and while good caching is critical for performance, when it goes bad, it, all, it, it can sometimes be very bad. We um, published a paper a while back where we looked at some caching effects gone bad in, um, in, in some very common applications on processors such as Skylake and Thunder X2. Um, and with, with vector architectures, these interactions and these effects become even more important because vector instructions are wide. They process uh, a lot of elements at the same time, which means they have the potential to touch a lot of memory areas at once. Um, with SVE, this just adds another dimension to the problem because the vector length is variable and SVE introduces a lot of uh, new different classes of vector operations that were not available in, in NEON, the previous uh, vector instruction. We've 
been investigating these effects using a cache simulator. And um, initially we surveyed the tools that are available trying to, to choose uh, the, best, the, the best ones that are suited for this um, investigation. Uh, but one, one of the uh, things we found early on was that existing tools are either too specific very targeted to one particular microarchitecture or, um, or instruction set. There are lots of Intel-based tools that only work on Intel. Um, and and the, uh, the other range of the spectrum are tools that are very generic. They, uh, they are completely architecture agnostic. They will, um, they, they will uh, take in generic memory traces and, and produce output. But the problem with those tools is that sometimes you cannot go into the depth that you want to investigate one particular instruction set. And this was the case with SVE um, in, in our, in, in our um, investigation. So we wanted to uh, have a closer look at how the, the features introduced in SVE affect these uh, caches. And that is something we could not do with more generic tools. So in the end, our decision was to use a, a custom built lightweight cache simulator. We built this on top of the ARM instruction emulator or ARMY. Um, which allowed us to take full advantage of the memory tracing feature that it supports. So ARMY is an emulator that runs on any um, A64 hardware. It runs the uh, regular scalar code natively and when it encounters SV instructions, it emulates them. And while it emulates them, it offers you the opportunity to write instrumentation to collect uh, data that you want about the instructions that are executed. Um, in our case, we use the memory trace feature, which uh, as the application runs, uh, uh, traces all the memory access is done. So reads and writes, uh, they're logged, the, the memory addresses, the reads and writes are performed to the sizes uh, and the relative ordering of those. This produces a very simple text-based format, um, text-based trace format, which shows just the memory operations that the application did and nothing else. This means that by taking in one of these traces, we get SVE support for free in our simulator, but we don't restrict our simulator to ARM or SVE in any way. At the end of the day, um, it's, it's a standard trace file. And if you can produce a similar trace file with, with a different tool, it should be easy to convert to this, um, to this format. To benchmark, we used three uh, mini apps. Mini apps are exactly at the right type of, uh, at the right scale for these investigations because they're big enough that they represent actual problems. They're, uh, they're bigger than, than micro benchmarks. They try and keep the same performance patterns and effects that you see in full scale applications, but they're small enough that you can, you can finally tune the problem sizes to your needs and, um, and they're, they're, they're easy to understand. These mini apps in particular, they're, many apps that we've worked with for a long time we understand very well in and out and we we know what the expected performance is uh, so that makes it easier to make sure that we don't we don't um, introduce confounders in our work the three mini apps that we used are cloverleaf which um, which was shown before as well it is a fluid dynamics mini app there is mega sweep which is a memory bandwidth benchmark uh, not unlike stream but which uh, takes the kernel from, from SNAP, the particle transport application. This gives it a uh, much higher dimensionality in, in, in a stream-like uh, pattern. This was originally developed for the paper I mentioned before to investigate cache hostile accesses. And then there's MiniFMM, which is a, a, a newer modern implementation of fast multiple method using a task-based approach. We restricted our investigations to single core and private caches without any prefetching. And we set the instrumentation in ARMY to um, only run, so we were only run a single thread. We didn't instrument any of the IO of the initialization or the validation in the mini apps. So all the data that we collected was restricted to the main computation kernel of the application. We validated our simulator using uh, performance counter data gathered for, uh, from real hardware. So we have access to some Thunder X2, which uses 128-bit vectors, and um, we had access to some A64FX, which uses 512-bit SVE. And we compared those numbers that we got from uh, hardware counters on these systems with the 128-bit and 512-bit modes in the cache simulator. And what we found is that there is uh, between about 2 and 10% difference on average between the data that the simulator produced and the hardware uh, counters from these systems on a variety of metrics that relate to 
uh, cache behaviors, uh, such as uh, accesses, um, hits, misses, and so on. When we chose the um, inputs for our benchmarks, we made sure that they are they remain representative of real world full scale applications. Uh, so. Uh, except for a scaling factor, because we scale down from a full node to a single core, the results maintain the same uh, performance, performance characteristics and should be e um, easily uh, extensible to full node applications. In the paper, there are all the details about the validation and how we restricted the inputs and so on. The first experiment that we run um, was we looked at hypothetical cache configurations and we wanted to see how some of these choices affect the performance of the cache. Uh, and for performance, we looked at the number of misses in terms of, of the miss rate. And for the uh, parameters that we varied, we used the cache line size, which varied between um, 64 bytes and 2048 bytes. We wanted to take a very small minimum value. I think uh, 64 is one of the uh, standard line sizes used in today's processors and 2048 was a deliberately big value to see what happens at the opposite end of the spectrum. And the same for associativity, we looked at the um, ways of the, of, the, of the cache and we set this between 2 and 32 for the same reason. We wanted a very small and a very large value. Um, and in general what we found was that having bigger cache lines almost always helped. Um, and that is because a lot of HPC applications have a very, uh, very, very good, well-structured memory access, which means once you fetch in a cache line, you are likely to, uh, to utilize all the data that is in there. So the longer the cache lines, the, the fewer cache lines you have to load overall to get in all the data for the applications. Um, but just but increasing the set size, on the other hand, did not always help on its own. Sometimes it made no difference. Sometimes it did make a difference at longer uh, cache lines in particular. So what I'm, slowing, what I'm showing on this slide is a couple of heat maps um, that show results for clover leaf. The numbers in each square are the miss rates of so the percentage of cache accesses that missed at that particular level. On the left hand side is the first level of cache, on the right hand side is the second level of cache. Um, on the y-axis here you we varied the line size starting at 64 bytes at the top and going up to 2048 bytes at the bottom and on the x-axis we varied the associativity starting from two-way associative to 32-way associative. Um, the colors, the, the darker the color the more misses there were. So in some sense, lighter colors correspond to better performance. You can observe here the effect I described earlier, where increasing the line size generally reduces the miss rates. But when you get to higher line sizes, 2048 bits say, um, you need to also increase the set size in order to keep the improved miss rate because otherwise it, it increases again. Um, while increasing light in sizes was almost always beneficial, we noticed that increasing associativity was more beneficial when the accesses were less structured. So on this slide, I'm showing a similar style graph for Mega Sweep and Mini FMM, the other two applications, which have a lot less structured memory access than Cloverleaf does. Cloverleaf has very well behaved uh, memory access patterns which is why when we compare it to say a stream performance uh, benchmark, the, the two of them all, uh, almost always have similar profiles. On the other hand, Megasweep and Mini FMM have a lot less structured access. Um, and in the case of, of Megasweep, for example, you can see that the um, higher associativity, so the more you go to the right of this graph, the uh, smaller the miss rates are and the same for Mini FMM. Um, in, in Cloverleaf, for example, going to higher associativity uh, reduced miss misses by about 3.5x, but for many FMM, this was about 18x. So that's a much, much bigger difference at 2048 byte long cache lines. In the paper, there are more details about how these effects uh, change with the mini apps, including a description of how they scale with the different SVE lengths. The next experiment we did is we looked at how much data, how long data stays resident in cache. 
So we took the configurations of the caches used in the Thunder X2 and the A64FX system. These are, um, these are, these are um, publicly described online and they're in the paper as well. Um, and we, um, we empirically tracked each cache line um, track the lifetime of each cache line. So this is, uh, in some sense, uh, a way to empirically look at the um, stack difference or evict distance. How 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 much how many cycles pass between when a cache line is loaded and when it is evicted. We scaled the vector width to analyze the differences. Um, and in, in general, we found that the longer cache lines in the A64FX, uh, 256 bytes versus 64 bytes, uh, overall read, led to more reuse. And the, the bigger the vector width, the more difference from Thunder X2. I'm showing these results here for Cloverleaf in two rows of histograms. The row at the top corresponds to the Thunder X2 cache configuration and the row at the bottom corresponds to A64FX. And these histograms show how many as a proportion of the total accesses performed uh, stayed in cache for a given duration. So on the x-axis we have um, how, how many accesses happened in between when a cache line was first loaded and when it was evicted and on the y-axis we have a, um, a fraction of, of uh, the total number of, of accesses. So the higher a bar is on this graph it means more of the accesses were in one of those histogram bins. The more to the right one of these bins is the longer it stayed in cache. And I'm showing here the um, mean and standard deviation of these graphs as two easy to understand ways to, 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 to describe these effects. So you can see that when we scale up the SVE width, so when we move from these columns to the right, uh, the, the peaks all shift to the left. And that's because data stays, um, stays in, in cache less. Every vector access brings in more data, touches more cache lines. So, lines, so older cache lines will be evicted quicker. On the A64FX compared to the Thunder X2, the profile is much flatter and uh, there, isn't, there isn't such a, a visible peak to the left as you can see on Thunder X2. It is all um, a lot flatter and shifted to the right. Uh, and this is one because the A64FX cache is, is bigger overall and two because of the longer cache lines. So sometimes uh, you do not need to ev evict other cache lines because the data is already in, in one of the bigger cache lines that is already stored. The paper shows these results for all the mini applications we covered. And then the last um, investigation that we did was to um, look in more detail at the non-contiguous mem memory operations that were added in SVE. So this being scatter uh, stores or gather loads where um, in, instead of writing to a contiguous piece of memory, you can, you can do strided or um, almost random access to different uh, parts of memory using single instructions. Um, this is important because in real implementations, performance of these processors uh, often depends on how many cache lines they touch with, the, um, with each instruction. So um, scatter and gather instructions can be very different depending on how many locations they access and how far apart these are. Um, but the number of cache lines touched is a good indicative of where um, performance is expected to be. Um, and what we saw was that the uh, longer cache lines in A64FX were much better suited to deal with these non-contiguous accesses than the Thunder X2 ones. So in this graph here on the left, um, I'm showing on the x-axis the number of cache lines touched um, and inside each of these bars, a uh, taller colored section means that a bigger proportion of the non-contiguous memory accesses uh, uh, touch that many lines. So for example, on the, in, in the case of 2048 um, SV bits, on the Thunder X2 configuration in blue here at the top, um, a, a number of the um, non-contiguous memory accesses touched 32 cache lines, whereas on the 64 FX, the maximum was um, around 10. We noticed that um, in general, uh, even though bigger cache lines help uh, by by loading more data at once and then needing fewer cache lines overall, there were always some accesses that were so far apart that the cache line size didn't matter. They were um, hundreds of bytes apart, which is longer than than the cache line sizes we have available in these processors. So. Um, so even though overall A64, the A64FX configuration 
needed about three times fewer lines on average than Thunder X2, there were still memory accesses which could not be uh, serviced in a single, with a single cache line. There is a lot of room for improvement for this work and some of the things we have outlined to do in the future are to introduce more types of caches and uh, policies and configurations for the cache simulator because uh, like I said before it is it is a very um, highly dimensional problem and the simulator has been designed with this modularity in mind um, so so this is something we need to do um, it gets more interesting but also much harder to do accurate simulations when you go to multi-core and and full node systems because some uh, some implementation details are not always public of course for the a64fx these these are public the architecture manual is public which is which is absolutely wonderful um, but sometimes they're not so sometimes you have to guess some of these parameters um, and when you go to to bigger scales memory trace sizes become a very important consideration so because these are text files they can take up hundreds of gigabytes very very easily um, so you need to consider alternative formats alternative collection methods um, and in the end our goal is not just to simulate caches but to build a simulator that can um, help us investigate hypothetical hpc systems all together so we we have this project we call simenge at the university of bristol where we want to simulate supercomputers with supercomputers. It's meant to be a flexible, accurate, and fast simulation toolkit designed specifically for SVE. Uh, so I'm sorry, for HPC, of which SVE is the first target. And we've already got models for the Thunder X2 and A64 cores, um, and we're just now adding support for memory hierarchy and uh, network connectivity. So this is, this is the end goal for this work. Um, so, in conclusion, I've briefly showed you that cache hierarchy is a very highly dimensional problem and there are many, many things to consider. Um, this is especially important to consider in, um, in the case of uh, vector processors where we're using wide vector widths and especially when you're dealing with uh, advanced vector instructions uh, such as those introduced in SVE, there may be even more additional configurations which are um, worth investigating before making design decisions. Here are uh, the two papers I mentioned before and um, with this I thank you for watching. These are the links to all the stuff we do at Bristol including a GitHub link if you want to have a look at the data used in this paper and two repositories that show exactly how we build and run our benchmarks and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Great talk. Um, first question is, why does increasing the L2 set size increase misses for Cloverleaf? Is there a fixed overall cache size? Yes, that's right. For those experiments, the, cache, the, the overall cache size was fixed. Excellent. And in cache lifetimes, what is the size of each cache line? I believe that's A64FX determined, right? Yeah, oh, so for these, uh, I assume it's, uh, the question is about these slides. These um, experiments were done for the configurations that we have in the TX2 and the A64FX. So for TX2, that is 64 bytes per cache line, and for A64FX, that's 256 bytes. Excellent. All right, no more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.